Safety and Security Policy and Finance Committee meeting to order. We'll start with the roll. Johnson. Here. Lomer. Here. Hillstrom. Here. Beckerfin. Constantine. <coughs> Dean. Frankie. Here. Grossel. Here. Howe. Here. Lucero. Newberger. O'Neill. Here. Pinto. Uglum. Here. Ward. Here. Zerwas. Representative Ward, have you had a chance to review the minutes? Yes, sir, Mr. Chair, and um, I move the minutes of March 7th. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, minutes are approved. This morning we have two bills up. The first one is House File 817 and Representative Lunan. We'll uh, make a motion to uh, re-refer to the House File 817 to the General Register. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Committee, for taking the time to hear the bill. Uh, this is a bill that uh, your committee heard last year and passed, and I'm going to offer uh, an A2 amendment uh, to the bill. What this bill is regarding is uh, making it illegal to access or to open the front of an ATM machine or a uh, gas pump uh, for the sake of uh, putting in skimmers. And the A2 amendment that you have in front of you simply broadens that consequences to attempting to open. So while you're trying to open it also, once we catch you trying to open it, that uh, you're going to incur consequences. And I ask that the, the amendment get moved. I will, the chair will move the A2 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Representative Lunen, uh, please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. The, uh, uh, what this bill does is it makes it illegal for someone to access, in other words, open the front of an ATM uh, or a gas pump. We had to do a carve out for the Commerce Department for their Weights and Measures Division so that they can still do their job to make sure that the, uh, the pumps are accurate. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward bill. Like I said, you guys have heard it before. Uh, uh, last year, uh, and um, I don't know if I've got some people here that want to testify or if you need testifiers or not, or do you have any questions? We do have a few testifiers. We'll start with Teresa Ross. Good morning, my name is Teresa Kuvas and I'm with the Minnesota Bankers Association. We represent 95% of the banks across Minnesota and I'm here today to speak in support of Representative Lunin's House File 817 to ensure that anyone who not only attaches a skimmer but anyone that is found attempting to attach or access a point of sale terminal is charged with a crime. Skimming and other types of card fraud are a widespread problem. The number of debit cards that were compromised in 2016 was up 70% from 2015 and up 40% in the first half of 2017. Consumers are always protected against unauthorized fraud losses and are refunded by the bank, but consumers must deal with the aftermath of having their cards information compromised. Banks acknowledge that skimming is a very serious problem. Banks stopped 89% of the attempted deposit card account fraud in 2016. So although the banks put the most of the bill, we all end up paying for these crimes. Anything that we can do to catch these criminals before they steal the customer's information would be helpful. And I would also like to acknowledge that the credit unions are also supportive of this bill. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the members? David Skilbred. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. Thank you for this time. My name is David Skilbred. i uh, just here to make a few points on behalf of the Independent Community Bankers of Minnesota and also on behalf of the Financial and Retailers Protection Association. The bill before you was developed by a committee representing Minnesota's lenders such as ICBM, retailers, and law enforcement uh, such as the Minnesota Sheriff's Association. They all got together in 2016 in the interim and tried to find a proposal that would reduce uh, skimming in Minnesota. Uh, it's growing all over the country. It's not just a Minnesota problem or a country problem, but it's a worldwide problem. 
and this is the result that they came up with. And what it really does is gives law enforcement the ability to do what they uh, need to do and want to do and uh, try to get a hold of this issue. It's a very important bill and we strongly support it. Thank you. Any questions from the members? Any Good. comments from members? Anybody from the public? Okay. At this time, I'll renew my motion that the House File 817 be re referred to the General Register as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you for coming here. Next, we have House File 2967. Representative Kathy Lomer. Please introduce yourself. Continue. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chair. Representative Kathy Lomer. And would you like me to move the bill? Uh, you can move the bill. Okay. I would uh, at this time like to move House File 2967. Is that the right number? And, and Mr. Chair, I we have an amendment. Can we uh, move that right away to get the bill in the shape that we want to hear it in, please? <coughs> we are we are moving this to ways and means. I don't couldn't hear if you said you uh, motion to move to ways and means. Oh, motion to move to ways and means. Thank you, Mr. Rep Chair. Representative Pindell. Oh. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I have uh, uh, a uh, an amendment. Um, to propose um, members have in the packet. It was uh, developed in consultation with Representative Lomer and with the proponents of the of the bill, um, the McLean Minnesota Catholic Conference, Minnesota Family Council, and so I'd ask um, members to to support it. All those in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed. Amendment is uh, so moved. Please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just before I get started, I just want to acknowledge and recognize there's a group of students from the University of St. Thomas and the College of St. Benedict's, along with some other citizens who are joining the committee today to support the bill. So again, Mr. Chair and members, thank you so much for, for hearing our bill today. Society is growing more aware of the horrors of sex trafficking, both abroad in the United States and right here in Minnesota. Traffickers deny victims basic human rights and victims and treat victims as commodities to be bought and sold. At the same time, pornography is widely accepted, openly defended, and even celebrated. Many people consider pornography nothing more than entertainment with no thought to the victim on either side of the screen. In reality, pornography and sex trafficking are inextricably linked. The U.S. pornography industry generates $13 billion each year. Pornography drives demand for sex trafficking by contributing to demand, grooming or training victims, and creating additional revenue streams for traffickers. Men who use pornography are far more likely to solicit women in prostitution than men who do not use pornography. This creates an increased demand for both pornographic materials and women in prostitution or sex trafficking. Pornography is used by traffickers to train victims to perform various sexual acts and situations. Many times, sex trafficking victims are forced to recreate scenes from pornography or forcibly recorded for pornographic purposes. Traffickers can sell pornographic material of their victims in addition to forcing them into prostitution. This not only gives the traffickers an additional revenue stream, but also attracts new clients. Traffickers are also Traffickers also use forced pornography as a method of control and blackmail, conveying the message to their victims that they can never escape the life. Pornography is harmful to everyone involved, performers, producers, and users. It corrupts their minds and hearts and causes them to break down ment mentally, physically, and spiritually. The bill before you, House File 2967, recognizes the link between pornography and human trafficking. 
It acknowledges the role pornography plays in contributing to a culture that devalues women and girls and promotes men treating women and girls as objects to be purchased, fueling the sex trafficking industry. So the first section of the bill deals with the human, human trafficking report that the Commissioner of Public Safety publishes every two years. Currently, the report includes statistics <coughs> on a list of crimes commonly associated with human trafficking. This bill would direct the report to additionally include two current crimes, possession of child pornography and display of harmful material to minors. This bill would also report, this bill would also allow the report to include information about how pornography supports and fosters trafficking, especially among women and children. The second section deals with the monetary assessments that would be imposed on crimes associated with human trafficking. Currently, a person convicted of various prostitution offenses acting as anyone other than the prostitute is subject to a monetary assessment, a portion of which goes to the Safe Harbor for Youth account for services to the sexually exploited youth. This bill would require all the crimes identified in the human, human trafficking report to be subject to the additional assessment, a portion of which goes to the Safe Harbor for Youth account. So just to be clear, this bill does not make pornography illegal, it doesn't create any new crimes, or it doesn't divert money away from any existing programs or entities. So with me today to testify in favor of the bill are Terry Ferletti and Lori Paul with Breaking Free and Minneapolis Police Sergeant Grant Snyder. And I'd like to invite them now up to testify. Welcome to the committee. If you could introduce yourself and uh, continue with your testimony. Hi, my name is Terry Ferletti. I am the executive um, director for Breaking Free. Um, good morning, chair and house members and friends. Uh, I testified in this very room six years ago for the Safe Harbor Bill to go through. I served, I currently serve on the Minnesota uh, Service Provider, uh, Minnesota Human Trafficking Task Force and was a member of the Service Provide Response Team for Super Bowl 52 uh, with Grant and a number of other people. I'm also a survivor of sex trafficking. Uh, we run, we're a, 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 a survivor-led organization um, here in St. Paul. And in my own personal experience as the executive director and with the 350 women that we see each year at Breaking Free, most all of them have had pornography influence them in negative ways. Uh, one of the reasons is it with grooming. For grooming, that is one of the techniques that perpetrators use to um, glean us, to teach us how to do some of the sex acts. Um, and excuse me, this is embarrassing and it's a little bit um, shaming to talk, but this is real. And I also want to let you know, I am testifying as a uh, adult victim service provider, so I, my organization does not benefit from this bill financially, but it is the right thing to do. There's also um, a, a demand because more exposure to pornography does a few things to, to people's brains. As it adjusts to dopamine, which uh, controls the brain's reward and pleasure centers and regulates emotional response, while viewing the same act, habitually the brain releases the same amount of chemicals, but the emotional response is lessened. So it's it's likened to heroin or cocaine or any kind of other addiction. It, it fuels that same pleasure center. We know that uh, Dr. Gail Dines talks about how we're now bringing up a generation of boys on cruel, violent porn. And given what we know about how images affect people, this is going to have a profound influence on their sexuality, behavior, and attitudes towards men. Um, we know that it perpetuates the rape culture, it provides hypersexualization of men, and it normalizes 
uh, violent sexuality and expectations that do not mirror reality. So very often if a man is watching pornography and he wants his wife to mimic what they're um, doing in these pornographic films, I don't know, um, and she doesn't want to do it, where do you suppose he's going to go? You know, there's going to be an outlet. And um, also, it's used as bondage. Very often when we're turned out, when we have that first sexual experience um, for money through the perpetrator, there those um, events are, are filmed. And they're used as blackmail. And I've seen it over and over and over again with our clients that have tried to get out of the life and their father might be on a board here or there. Uh, one of our members was on a board at Cargill. They used that pornography against his daughter to uh, ruin their economic security. So we see a direct link on pornography and sexual exploitation. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lori Paul. I'm with Breaking Free. Thank you, Mr. Chair and the committee for listening today. I'm gonna to be telling more my story, my testimony. Uh, back in the 80s, I worked at a restaurant bar and it was popular. And a lot of the professional athletes would go there. And there was one man who was with a football team, pro football player, and he would come and he would see me. And uh, we would talk a little bit, flirt a little bit, and uh, he would come more frequently. And he was with a buddy, too, after practices. And his buddy would say, hey, there's your girl. And so one day, finally, he asked me for my phone number. And he asked me out for a date that night. And so he called and he came and he picked me up at 7 that evening, just like he said. And I was excited. I thought, oh, I wonder what we're going to be doing on our date. And uh, pulled up in a nice, nice Jeep and we went to apartment building. And he opened the door and it was just a small studio. And uh, this is in the 80s, so there wasn't like the flat screens on the wall, but there was a screen that he had on the wall. And there was a couch. And on that screen playing was pornography. I was terrified. And he went for my pants, and I panicked. And the only thing I could think of to do or say at that moment was, I have my period. And he stopped. And then he got really mad. And he says, well, you owe me. And it was oral sex was what he wanted. He said something else. Now, a defensive tackle average size is six foot five, 300 pounds. And then there was me. And so I did what he asked. He brought me back, didn't say anything, never called me again, never came back to the restaurant I worked at. So his intention was that. I later married another professional athlete, um, different, different sport. We had a long marriage and uh, I discovered some affairs and he repented. But then there was other things that, that he turned to. And um, the symptoms of that is distancing. It's inability to have erection. It takes more for that to happen because of what they've been viewing. And then there's anger. And a 30-year marriage recently ended. And we have a son, he just turned 13 on Sunday. When he was 12 years old, I grabbed his phone and I found tabs of pornography on his phone. My little boy, my little boy. There was a cartoon even of something he watched in hardcore porn. We have a chance to do something different for our boys and our girls. I'm a broken-hearted mom, and I'm a broken-hearted wife, and I'm a broken-hearted young girl who just wanted to be loved. This spans 
and we have an opportunity to start to make a difference. Thank you for listening. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, my name is Sergeant Grant Snyder. I'm a detective with Minneapolis Police. I'm the lead investigator for our um, for our team in Minneapolis and have been for a number of years. I've worked on trafficking uh, approximately for the last two decades. I've had the good advantage to travel relatively frequently and to have connection all over the country. Um, I've uh, trained for uh, the federal government. I've trained for a number of different organizations to include uh, Polaris, NICMIC, um, IACP, the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Uh, and so I've had a, an opportunity to sort of recognize and understand how the issue of pornography fits into the greater picture of sex trafficking and exploitation in general. Uh, my, the way that, that I come at this issue of pornography and its connection to sex trafficking really has to do with the comorbidity of how often and how frequently we find the two of them connected. And in fact, um, it, it, it unfolds on a couple of different parallel tracks. The first, has to do with the impact on the victims themselves as well as the use of pornography by the traffickers and how it is that that sort of articulates into the overall sex trafficking scheme. We worked uh, a forced pornography case last summer. It was a North Minneapolis case that involved a fairly violent gang, a 15, I'm sorry, 14 year old young lady who was subjected to um, uh, forced pornography that showed up on Facebook and it was, it was trade amongst the members of the gang on Facebook Messenger. This, uh, all of the gang members, by the way, were juveniles. Um, this 30 second video clip was used to um, force this young lady at the threat of releasing that to family and friends on Facebook, was used to force her to not only perform sex acts for the various gang members, but also to use as a source of commerce for them to be able to, to make money and, uh, and exploit her. Uh, additionally, there's, so in addition to that, that experience of her having this used against her, we have run repeatedly into uh, this nexus of sex trafficking and um, child porn. I can't think of a single case I've worked in the last two years where we haven't uh, been able to look at that case both as a manufacturer possession of child porn case. This is one of the biggest ways that traffickers will advertise their victims. Um, probably most importantly though, and I think the biggest place where we lack a real understanding of what the connection here is and what it really means has to do with the demand. And four years ago in February of 2014, we started Operation Guardian Angel which is our felony level uh, demand based operation that was we, we worked with uh, Ramsey County Attorney's Office, Hennepin County, Anoka County, Scott County, Washington County, Dakota County. We've, we've done it not only here in, the, in uh, Minnesota, but we've also done it in seven different states. We've arrested over a thousand men, all of for felonies and our conviction rate exceeds 98%. I can't think of a single crime where you have that level of conviction uh, for the crime that they've actually been arrested for. One of the things is we start to look at that data and that thousand plus men that we've arrested, all of whom have very low level of criminal involvement, about 84% of them have either just minor traffic violations or no criminal history whatsoever. One of the big things that we have seen through this data is the high level of pornography use among these guys, not only as a, a sort of an introduction into the idea of sexual exploitation, but also as a rehearsal. I used to train, when I would train cops, they used to say there's a straight line right from pornography right through the strip clubs and to um, sex trafficking or to, to one of the online resources. That has continued to sort of escalate that behavior and when we've had the opportunity to talk with these men, we've had the opportunity to sort of understand what their background is. Most obviously in like the pre-sentence investigations and the psychosexual um, reports that have come out of this, they're reporting a very early exposure to pornography and, and a very frequent use of it. And so the connection between pornography and sex trafficking operates on a few different levels. What we understand anecdotally is very different than what we understand empirically and I think that's one of the reasons why many of us in law enforcement and particularly those of us that do this work are real excited about this legislation. Uh, Representative Gross. Thank you, this is a, a question for the testifier. As far as uh, your experience and uh, the uh, frequency 
and the increase of, of child pornography? Are you guys seeing a, a, an increase not only in the viewing of the child pornography, but also a crossing over and uh, not just looking, but committing? Uh, uh, Sergeant uh, Snyder. Mr. Chair, Representative, thank you for the question. We absolutely have seen that. Um, that's part of that escalation factor and part of the big, and Terry mentioned sort of the dopamine loop that occurs with pornography. And, and when you talk to these guys, um, that's exactly what happens with them is that that habituation and it sort of leads them into a place where now what was previously just viewing pornography turns into a rehearsal and it leads them right into a place where now they can sort of experientially involve that because one of the real important things we understand about biochemistry and porn is that at some point that habituation in the same way that a drug addiction happens, it's no longer enough to attain the same level of sexual gratification. So they just continue to get worse? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Representative Pinto. I thank Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Representative Lomer, for bringing this forward. Um, I want to thank um, Ms. Paul for sharing her story. We hadn't had the chance to interact before, and appreciate you. Um, it's really powerful in sharing that with, with all of us. Um, I have had the chance to work a lot with Ms. Verlitti and Sergeant Snyder, who are amazing, and I've had the chance to do trainings and other things with them. Um, just to remind members of the committee, for a couple of years I was the director of um, statewide training and protocol development under the Safe Harbor System, so trained thousands of um, officers and, and uh, professionals in various um, disciplines. Um, and I'm really, so really, really glad to have this brought forward. Um, I feel like for folks on the progressive side, sometimes we really downplay the dangers of, of pornography. Um, um, and don't think so much about about that. Um, and in working with the sexual violence advocates that I have through the years, um, they really point out that whatever the pornography of, of yesteryear was like, the 21st century version is particularly violent, cruel, degrading, warping minds, um, especially of our young people in terms of what they're learning about sexuality. So um, I'm especially grateful um, Representative Lomer, if you bring this forward. Um, I, 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 uh, I'm really glad with the amendment. I really appreciate um, you working with me on that too, Representative Lomer. Um, to just acknowledge that there really are a variety of social factors, um, to recognize that poverty, um, housing instability, food, insta food insecurity, um, I think about um, the young people that I've spoken with um, who've been involved in this, racial inequities, gender inequities, there's a whole long list. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily put pornography at the very top of the list, but it definitely is solidly on the list, and it's something that we, and again, especially I feel like sometimes for folks coming from my perspective, downplay, and so I'm really grateful to the testifiers um, uh, and uh, Representative Lomer and for the folks who brought this forward. So thank you very much. Representative Constantine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And actually, this question is for Mr. Walsh. Uh, Mr. Walsh, uh, can you give us an idea of what kind of money uh, this will generate for Safe Harbor? Mr. Walsh. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Considine, um the fiscal note that's in your packets was prepared to the Senate Companion, and absent from that, um, the fiscal note currently is uh, an estimate of revenue. I did have a conversation with the courts, and similar to many other bills um, that um, add something to criminal statutes or um, are, add some uh, smaller offenses to a broader uh, category of offenses, it's difficult for um, any department to estimate how many um, offenses will occur when when um, there is no uh, background uh, previous to estimate on. But um, in addition to that, um, the revenue of, from criminal fines uh, goes, is, is collected on a different basis based on the jurisdiction where that uh, prosecutes that uh, criminal offense. And so it's difficult for them to ascertain how much money will be collected in total, and then from that, how much will flow to the uh, general fund. So in cases such as this, um, even though there is no official uh, estimate from the courts so far, um, it's that the, the revenue assumed will be most likely minimal, and hard to pin down exactly how much would flow to the state due to those factors of uh, where it's prosecuted. Representative Constantine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I got a little bit of a concern that um, 
we look at this being a bonanza for Safe Harbor, uh, we need to continue to fund Safe Harbor. And I don't want to see a bill coming down saying, oh, they're going to get this a lot of money from this and we don't need to step up and continue to fund them. So um, what I'm hearing is it'll be minimal and we still need to continue to fund that program. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? <clears throat> Any comments or from from the public? Is uh, it, I actually have a couple questions on the fiscal note. Is uh, Rayon Magnuson happen to be here? Mistakes. And I was just wondering on the fiscal note, there's a my expenditure, it's not a large expenditure, expenditure but there is a small one. I was wondering if you could explain that. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee, uh, my name is Rayon Magnuson. I'm the director for the Office of Justice Programs. Um, thank you for uh, having me today. Um, the, the fiscal note that we prepared initially is really related just to the report. Um, the cost are, we estimated at around ten to $11,000, which I know is, is a very small amount. Um, we produce between five and eight reports a year for the legislature in different, in different committees. This is one of them that we absorbed a few years ago when, frankly, we had much more administrative money. Uh, and right now, uh, our research division is funded only by federal dollars, so it's very difficult for us to produce this report in a really comprehensive good way. So we do want to do it. Um, I'm, I'm glad they're adding pornography as far as the data. I think that that's a good idea for me personally. I, I support that. Um, but we do have cost and um, it's, I know you hear this from, from many, many uh, divisions, but I wanted to at least alert the committee today that um, it's, it's difficult to absorb, but that's what we've been doing, and that's the fiscal note is related specifically to staff time, which is about 200 hours. Uh, nothing to do with these other fees or penalties that uh, the representative is adding. Thank you. Well, Murray, do you wish to uh, renew your motion? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I do, but just before I do that, I just wanted to direct members in case you didn't see the letter of support from um, John Choi, Attorney, Ramsey County Attorney John Choi, that's in your packet. So just wanted to direct you and, and just thank you all for your support. This is uh, nice to have such great bipartisan support, and I will renew my motion that House File 2967 be referred to the general, no, be referred to Ways and Means. As amended. As amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, with that motion, all those in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. You're on your ways to ways and means. Thank you so much. I, I also want to thank the testifiers. I know it was very uh, difficult for some of you to do that testimony, and it, we appreciate it. Are there any other? Questions or we will adjourn.